For those of you who don't know me, my day job is as a consultant obstetrician at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital here in London, and um, I'm also the editor-in-chief currently of the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and an emeritus professor at Imperial College, so that's me. That's my credentials, if you like, for knowing something about this subject. And my other credential is having known Jane uh, since uh, she, she got me involved in this, uh, what, 15 years ago or so. So that's probably the most important thing. So just to uh, say we've got uh, the patron of uh, Group B Strep here, and uh, he's willing to uh, contribute and answer any questions later. He's, he's been a patron for as long as I can remember, as long as he can remember, because I asked him. Uh, and he, as you know, he's on this morning program. Now, the medical advisory panel, there's me, uh, the chair. Uh, the neonatologist is Alison Bedford Russell. She leads the neonatal network for the Southwest Midlands, and so uh, she's also an associate professor at the Warwick Medical School. So, uh, and her particular interest is in infection in newborn babies. So, a particularly appropriate person. Um, and uh, microbiologist, Dr. Christine McCartney, OBE, she's the executive director of the Health Protections Agency Microbiology Service. So she's one of the, she's probably the senior microbiologist in the whole of the UK. So she's, again, it's a great privilege to have her advise us, and she's a great supporter of the charity. And, and we also have with us today Philippa Cox, who's a senior midwife at the Honington Hospital, and uh, it's important that we keep the midwives involved in this whole process because they're the people predominantly who deliver the care. And uh, you've heard it mentioned already, but there is another well-known supporter. I won't say that, you may recognize the picture. Okay, so what is the importance of Group B strep? Well, the first thing to say is that one in four women will carry it. So that's quite a lot of the women in this room are likely to be carriers. And it's normal. It's not a disease. It's not an infection as such. It's something that is a perfectly healthy uh, commensal in the bowel, provided it remains in its place. And that's the problem. Um, and because it can creep up into the vagina and thereby get on, uh, onto a newborn baby, uh, this is how it gets into babies. That For some reason, some babies are genetically programmed. They have low resistance to this particular bug, and they're the ones who sadly come to grief. Once you get beyond about three months of age, it's no longer a problem. So it's something very specific to the newborn period, as we've heard. Most of the cases that we deal with is going to be about 75% uh, of all group B strep cases in infancy are what we call early onset, that's in the first week, and indeed 90% of those are within the first 12 hours. So it's a very localised period, which is why it makes it easier for us to target it. As we've heard, it usually causes infection of the blood and pneumonia. About 1 in 10 babies will die if they get this infection, and about 1 in 15 will go on to have a long-term handicap, it's particularly uh, worrying, of course. And the key, next key thing, is that 90% of all these deaths and disabilities can be prevented by giving intravenous penicillin just during labor. So perhaps sometimes as little as one dose, sometimes three or four doses, but very rarely longer than 24 hours. So it's a short burst. It's an appropriate antibiotic. The, the group B strep remains sensitive to it, etc. So what's the chance, actually, of a baby developing early-onset GBS disease? Well, if we don't know anything about it, just take any thousand women, pregnant women at random, it'll be about one in a thousand. But if she's known to be a carrier, that increases the risk threefold. So now it's one in 300. And if she's had a previous baby, it's going to be one in 100. So this is not a very tiny risk. It's not a huge risk, but it's, it's not very tiny either. And if we actually look at the numbers, because that's... Journalists in particular are often interested in, in numbers. If you look at the cases of proven infection where they actually cultured the bug uh, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland to the Health Protection Agency, in 2010 it was about 300 cases. But we think there are at least another twice as many cases that were probably group B strep, but for some reason they didn't get culture or the baby had already been given some antibiotics or something and they couldn't grow it. So we think that overall the probable cases are about 1,000 a year, so that's plenty, it's a lot. Um, and without any treatment, 60 of those would die. Currently, there is a sort of patchwork of risk-based treatment. So we think about half of those mothers who should get it probably get some prophylaxis. Uh, but if we introduce proper targeted screening, we could reduce that, currently about 30, we think, to about six. So we're saving 24 babies' lives a year. Uh, and more importantly, in some other respects, is that in terms of numbers, 
If you look at the 1,000 babies who are getting it, we prevent 800 of those. That's 800 babies not going to special care, whose parents don't have the anxiety and, and the worry and, and, and angst of, of having their child ill and support and so on and so forth. So that's a lot of babies each year, 800 families as well. So what about preventing it? Well, it's all about testing. And uh, one immediate problem is that if you use a standard culture test that they use for high vaginal swabs in the UK, for women who just say they've got a discharge, about half of the women are carriers, it will not pick up the group strep because it's not designed for that particular bug. So the current test which is readily available is not really suitable. And so we should be using the enriched culture medium test, which is the gold standard, and that will pick up 95% of women who are carriers. So it's, it's not 100% reliable, but it's very, very reliable by comparison with many other screening tests. And because women's carriage of groovy strep can come and go, if we test 35 to 37 weeks, about three to five weeks before the average onset of labor, uh, nearly 90%, 87% in most studies than average, uh, will still be carrying when they deliver. So we'll know when they go into labor that they're the women that should be getting the penicillin. Uh, and we've already said that uh, the penicillin will prevent 90% of infections. Now, you've heard that we're still not actually practicing screening in the UK, and yet there are people who've looked at this repeatedly within the UK. This was a paper in the British Medical Journal, and it's from Ruth Gilbert's group, and she is uh, a, research, um, a professor at the uh, Centre for Pediatric Epidemiology and Biostatistics and the Centre for Evidence-Based Child Health, the Great Ormond Street. So they know a lot about analysing the evidence to see whether something is effective. And looking at what they concluded, that culture testing for low-risk women while treating all women who are in preterm labour and other high-risk women uh, would be the most cost-effective option. Quite clearly, better than the risk factor approach which is still used in the UK. Now there's another group which looks at health economics, and this is the Birmingham group, and, and the, this is a, a study which was actually done for the Health Technology Assessment Program, uh, government funded, uh, and they then went on to write this up as a paper in, in our journal, in fact, and they found that the most cost-effective strategy was to treat everyone, well, we're not going to treat 100% of women, and that if you didn't want to do that, the next best strategy was to screen. So that was a very straightforward conclusion from their paper. They wrote this up in BJOL, which is the journal which I edit. And they specifically said in their paper, the current Royal College of ONG National Screening Committee recommended strategy of risk factor-based screening is not cost-effective compared with screening based on culture. So these are studies done by two big health economics groups in the UK on the UK situation. So this is not referring to these other countries, but in the UK, they concluded that screening was much more cost effective. So are there any reasons not to screen? Well, sometimes people say, oh, well, you're giving all these women penicillin and they'll die because they're allergic. In fact, the true allergy um, for, to penicillin, not a rash or a bit of diarrhea, is actually quite uncommon, about one in 10,000. And if you're actually giving it when somebody's already got a drip up, for example, if they're in labor and you can give them uh, treatment for it, the mortality is extremely low, and the key statistic is that when they started the program of screening and giving antibiotics, penicillin in the USA, they, the first 1.8 million women who were treated, there were no deaths from anaphylaxis. So it's a vanishingly small risk. So I think we can put that to one side. Now, Alison Bedford-Russell, I mentioned, is very keen that doctors shouldn't be overusing antibiotics. So uh, would we be giving too many antibiotics? What we know is that this is really only a problem if you give broad-spectrum antibiotics over a long period of time. That's when bugs become resistant. And that's not what we're recommending. We're recommending giving penicillin, which has a very narrow spectrum, very specific for group B strep, for up to 24 hours only for this specific purpose. So this is, and in fact, in the States, they've done very careful studies and shown that there's no increase in other types of infection. So there's nothing coming in to fill the gap when you get rid of the group B strep. It, it actually works. Uh, if we look at um, the, uh, another interesting point here, this was again from the Daniels paper uh, from 2010 now, so this is just a couple of years ago. They actually studied nearly 1,400 women in the UK, and they found that 22% had one or more risk factors and should have been given penicillin in labor. As it turns out, a lot of them were, but they should have been. But the problem is that if you give it to women with risk factors, 
only about 29% of them, or less than a third, will actually be carriers. So you're giving two-thirds of them penicillin unnecessarily. Whereas the uh, four out of five women who are carriers are not being picked up by this, and they're not getting it. And so you end up with this uh, interesting situation that, uh, as we said, 70% of carriers have no risk factors. Um, and therefore, if you treat the women with risk factors as currently recommended, you actually end up treating slightly more women than if you screen and treat only the women who are carriers. And so this is the strange thing. We're actually saying we don't, we don't want to give more antibodies, we just want to give them to the right women. So, um, what, what is else is going on around the world? I just thought I'd finish by saying that these are the latest recommendations for the Center for Disease Control in the USA, which is a very... Uh, I don't think that means I've got to stop in the division. Um, and what they've said is that women with GBS isolated from the urine at any time or previous affected baby should have antibiotic prophylaxis. All other pregnant women should be screened 35 to 37 weeks uh, and are then offered... Uh, intravenous penicillin during uh, the time of labor. And the Pediatrics Journal is the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So it's not just the CDC uh, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, but the pediatricians as well revised their comprehensive guidelines and endorsed them and said that the major prevention strategy should be universal antenatal group B strep screen. And if you go to the States, this is a no-brainer. They've been doing it for 15 years. They keep reviewing the evidence. As far as they're concerned, the evidence is overwhelming. So um, if you want more details, uh, Jane and I published this paper in seminars uh, last year, which has a lot of the issues about the myths and, and so on, the, the wrong ideas that go around about group B strep. But basically, we think the medical evidence is clearly overwhelming, and it's time that this country got itself uh, up to the same level as all these other developed countries. 